All right, good afternoon, and welcome to the Patriotic Dragon Radio Program, the show to bring open, honest, thoughtful conversation back, allowing individuals and groups to be a part of a better, brighter future. As always, the views expressed on the program are not necessarily those of the guest, WYYZ, Pickens GOP, or the sponsor. This, this month's sponsor is the Pickens County GOP. Our Republican Party is here to support all candidates in their primary bid and to support the, in the general election candidate in local, state, and national elections. Please look for us at our new website, Pickens GOP, to get information and get involved. Our guests this week are Susan Finley, running for the Post 4 Pickens County Board of Education, and Mike Scoopin, running for the 9th Congressional District. And uh, also on us with us this week, our panelist, Bart Connolly. Thank you, Bart, for being on. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here, Will. You know that. All right. And Susan, thank you for being on with us. All right. Thank you, Will. I appreciate you inviting me to be here. Great. Uh, what I'd like to, to start with is for us just, uh, Susan, I, I know the listeners would like to know more about what made you decide to enter this race. Well, uh, over the years, I've attended Board of Education meetings just because I was a teacher and I was concerned about um, interested in, in watching the process and seeing how decisions were approached. Um, and then several years ago, I just started thinking, what if? And, and started dreaming my dream, I guess. And this summer, I had pretty much talked myself out of it. And then I had a friend call me and said, I've been talking to some people and your name keeps coming up. How would you, would you be interested in running for the Board of Education? And I said, well, I'd actually thought about it and so I thought about it some more and thought, you know, now that I am retired from the Pickens County school system, this might be a real good way that I could continue to serve the students that, that I love and the parents that I really appreciate. Cool. Well, great, great. W would you tell the listeners where your district is so that, you know, because with the school board, you have them five districts throughout the county. Some people don't know what district they're in or what post it is. And okay. Uh, post 4 covers Tate and Nelson and that area and that got part of the county. Um, it, it's currently being held, the post is currently being held by Peggy Andrews. And I, um, I thought I would just like to step in and help as well. The board's done a lot of great work over the years, and I'd like to help continue that tradition. Okay. All right. And kind of go over your work back background other than, uh, you know, being a teacher, but let's, you know, we, we can't do your resume on, on the air, but we can definitely let you, you go through it. So. Okay. Uh, I did not get my college degree until I had children in elementary schools and I worked full time while I was doing that. So I was pretty busy at that time. Uh, up until that time, I was a part-time secretary so that I could be home with my children, you know, when their dad couldn't be there. And um, my last secretarial position before I came to Pickens County and uh, started working for the school system was as a legal secretary for the Professional Practices Commission. And they investigate teachers who violate the code of ethics. Mm. So I was not an investigator. I was one of the legal secretaries. But it was an incredibly interesting job. And I learned a lot about the how not to part of being a teacher, things that you should not do, especially on spring break. But um, it, was, it was very interesting, and I worked with a lot of great folks who, were, uh, who had been educators and administrators and school superintendents. And so I was able to listen to their stories, and it really caught my attention, and, and I was, it, it touched my heart. And when I moved to Pickens County, I was able to start working on a provisional certificate and went to North Georgia College, got my my teaching certificate as well as my master's in special education. Okay. And I taught um, I taught school for 15 years in Pickens County. And primarily was the was it in the special education portion of education or across the full spectrum? Well, I have always uh, functioned as a special education teacher. I am certified to teach regular education as well. That I got those certificates just for my peace of mind as an insurance policy so that if I needed to move or you know I needed to be flexible that I would still be able to be employed but my heart's with special education I have two cousins who have special needs okay. uh, one is uh, one has autism the other one is mildly intellectually disabled and so um, special needs 
has just been a part of my family all of my life. I feel very comfortable with that population. I feel very passionate about defending them. I'm very sympathetic to the parents. I've, I've seen the, what, what, how that impacts families. And uh, for the first five years when I started working for Pickens County, I worked in the preschool department. And I did not have a class of my own individually, but I worked a lot of the time with parents who were bringing their three-year-old children to us because services begin at three years old oh, by law. Mm -hmm. That's awful young. It is, it, but yeah. it's great yeah. when we can get them that young you and start, start working with them. Yes. Absolutely. Wow. And so the parents at that point were just becoming aware of what the school system had to offer. Sure. And my job was to let them be aware of what their legal rights were and the services that we could provide and the services that need perhaps to be provided from another agency or something like that. But it's been wonderful. When I first was with preschool, I worked with certain students and as I taught middle school. <laughs> I saw the, those same faces. They were just on taller bodies walking <laughs> through the hall. And some of them remembered me, some of them didn't. But um, it was just wonderful to see how well the students did in school and to know that I had a part in that in the oh, beginning. Absolutely, yeah. So with, with that experience, you uh, it gives you a full spectrum, I think, more so than maybe a lot of other people who might consider doing it and not have an educational background, much less have the legal background as far as what's required and what mm -hmm. the maybe in the system works and what could be improved on Right. as well. So right. Uh, it's Some teachers um, are not completely aware of the, ed the code of ethics for educators and I know the administrators at the beginning of every year do make a point of making sure that, that the teachers review that and you kind of keep it in your mind but sometimes <laughs> teachers are very well-meaning but they just maybe are a little too comfortable and, and they don't think about the, the legal implications of some of their some of their decisions and sure okay Mark, you uh, would you would do you have a platform that you hope to accomplish if you are elected to the school board? Okay, I appreciate the question. Um, I have I, I have four things that I mentioned in my newspaper article that I'd like to focus on primarily, and one is teacher morale. And I hate to say that it's pretty bad, but it's pretty bad. I left the classroom in May of 2015. It's not even been a year since I've been out, and I can tell you from a personal perspective and from friends who work in the system, teaching probably across the board, but at least in Pickens County, is not what it was even 15 years ago. Teachers' individuality, their professionalism has been questioned. Um, I see a... a an atmosphere of micromanaging going on. I hate to see pe teachers struggling, but I have had multiple friends in talking with me be in tears because they know what the students need, but whether it's at whatever level the decisions come down, and I'm not saying that they're all coming from our Pickens administrators by any means, they have to answer to the federal and state government as well. Um, but there are some deep-seated problems there that we need to take care of. But when we're trained to help our students to see what they need, to, to try to remediate as best we can when there is a whole classroom full of 30 to 35 students in a regular education classroom, it's, it's heartbreaking, really. And I have, I was, I had the luxury of being able to quit my job. I had just decided last spring, I had enough signs that I thought, this just isn't going to go well if I stay. I need to, I need to move on. But I'm very fortunate in that I'm now working for DFAX and I'm working as a math tutor. And I can give the students exactly what they need. Yeah. I have that freedom now to teach. And I've had friends tell me, I can hear it in your voice. You have your passion back. You have your joy back. And that's exciting. But I have had teachers tell me, and we've had, we've had an awful lot of teachers leave the last few years. When I first started teaching in Pickens County, there were very few openings every year. Teachers would say, I could make more money in XYZ County, 
but I want to stay here. This is my family. This is where this this is where the people that I care about go to school. Yeah. And it's not that way anymore. And teachers that would say, I may take a hit on my check when I leave. I may get less retirement, but I cannot stay another day. And they would walk out. I've had other teachers say, I am so caught because I only have 10 or 15 years in now. My children still even haven't gone to college. I have to stay. Mm -hmm. And they would leave if they could. If every teacher could leave if they could, we would not have enough teachers in this county to get the job done. Something has to be done, and I, as you can tell from the way I've gone on about this, I feel very passionate about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, what's the, what's the best way for citizens to reach out to you to support you, get more detailed information on your standings, and obviously to support you in your, your, your efforts for the uh, post? Okay. Well, I tell you what, I thought of something else. Let me just Oh, finish okay. finish this over here. Yeah. I also feel very strongly about seeing if we can't possibly reduce the number of standardized tests that we give to the kids. Sometimes we put more on ourselves than the government asks of us. And I, I just want to look at it. I don't know the numbers, but I just want to investigate that. And also, because of the population that I have taught for so long, I would like to see a greater variety of vocational classes offered at the high school level. I think that would be wonderful. Not every student needs to go to a four-year college. I'm all for college education. I mean, I think it's great. But I have students who were so gifted mechanically, artistically, in so many different domains, and I know they will make fantastic plumbers, mechanics, all these sorts of things that, and I told them, I said, you'll be making more money than I will when I bring you my car to fix. You'll be making more money than Miss Finley. Um, so I, I'd really like to see that because the message, and it may not be delib a deliberate attempt, but the message that at least the middle school students get is that you need to go to college. Yeah. And I would always tell them, that doesn't have to be the case, but do have some sort of education after you graduate from high school. Yeah. Well, and that's something that is near and dear to, to Bart and my heart from the field of, of endeavor that Bart spent his whole life in. We know what it's like to have an uneducated plumber yes. <laughs> work on a project. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, technical education uh, uh, is, is something that we need to invest far more in mm -hmm. uh, because... And, and the way the system is set up in Georgia, and a lot, of, I really feel like, and I'm not going to say that the advisors at the high school don't do a good job because they do a good job, I think, for what they they have for that information. But there's so much opportunity for young people to expand and do things that, that they would love mm -hmm. that are technical or to your certification. And in Georgia, virtually all of our technical schools, that turns around and transfers to Georgia Tech or mm -hmm. to a UGA. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like they're losing anything by following the technical field and making sure before they spend four, six, or eight years in, in a mm -hmm. university that it's the field they really want to study for the next and work in the next 30 years. Absolutely. And one of the things, too, with, with Appalachian Tech being right here in our city, our county, the students can go to school, but they don't have to pay room and board for, for being on yeah. campus. They can stay with mom and dad. That might not be what they really want to do, <laughs> but it saves an awful lot of money while they're doing this and getting prepared to be in, out in the world and, and that sort of thing. But you asked about how to get in touch with me. My uh, cell number is 678-315-4684. Six seven eight three one five four six eight five. My email address is susanlin fifty three at yahoo.com. S U S A N L Y N N five three at yahoo.com. And I would love to hear from anybody. I have ideas, but I want to hear from the folks in the county and if there's any way at all that I can help our teachers and our students, I'm more than happy to do so. All right. Well, great. Thank you for being on, and we'd like to have you back as the the, uh, the everything progresses and we get closer to the, uh, the actual election this spring. Okay, great. So, Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. And now I'd like to introduce Mike Scoopin. 
Um, Mike, you're uh, you're running for the uh, 9th Congressional District. Good to have you on the show. Thank you, Will. It's good to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Um, if you would, um, tell the listeners about yourself and your, your background. My educational background is, is quite varied. Uh, I've got an architectural degree in engineering, uh, a BBA degree in economics from North Georgia College, and a master's in uh, technology management from Southern Polytechnic and State University. And my basic career is, is about as varied. Uh, I have been a land surveyor probably longer than any other single thing, had a survey business in, in Lumpkin County and Hall County, and uh, had a gift store at one time, uh, done several other uh, minor different things d during my career. Also, uh, at one point, uh, was building uh, cabins up in the mountains and a lot of people have asked me, well, when did you retire? And my answer is, no, the economy kind of bottomed out and my business just stopped. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, just, I just chose not to go back into it. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So I guess technically it was a retirement, but it was sort of not my idea at the time. Sure, sure. So okay. that's, that's kind of my general, general background. Uh, really have enjoyed uh, land surveying and running the gift store that we had at one time. That, both of those were a lot of fun. And where was the gift store at? Gift store was in Athens, Georgia. Oh, really? No. Oh, so it was all yellow jackets. No, I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> go dogs, go dogs, go dogs. All right. Yeah. Well, good. Um, well, if you would, uh, you know, planning for 2016 and beyond, what are what are some of the items uh, that you as a congressman will be focused on? My main focus and the, the primary reason that I'm running for Congress is – our country is in serious jeopardy, and we're in that situation really for one single reason. Uh, a lot of people want to throw out, well, we need to do this, we need to do that. But the bottom line is we need to go back to our Constitution. If we follow the Constitution, we do not need a balanced budget amendment. Uh, we don't need a lot of things. If we were following the Constitution, we would not have a $19 trillion debt because the federal government is very limited in the things that they are supposed to be doing. The problem we have in this nation is they've moved completely outside of the Constitution, and Congress and the President both totally ignore it, as well as the courts. So my main focus is to do everything that I can to rein that in and to pull us back to the Constitution. That, unfortunately, is probably going to indicate a lot of votes that say no when I get up there because so much of what they're doing right now is just simply not following the Constitution. We've got to get back to that, and the only way to do it is to force them. They're not going to do it willingly. Right. Okay. And, and expand, if you would, a little bit on your, your constitutional focus and, and your, your background there because I, I know – from previous experience that you've done a lot of speaking and uh, education to groups, that type of thing. So. Yeah, um, like a lot of people, uh, I kind of was following my own little path, going through the world, just having a good time and not really paying much attention to my government. What really woke me up was back in the late 70s. Uh, some of you may remember uh, Ronald Reagan and when he did not make it the first time when he ran and the GOP kind of stood in his way, he started putting out little blurps on the radio, just little short little ditties about uh, the Constitution and about just different aspects of economics and things like that. They were just really powerful, short little presentations. And that really caught my attention. And I think that was when I began to really wake up and say, wait a minute, something's not right in, in America where our government is going. And one of the, the next, I think, major thing that really got my attention was in 2004 when the Minutemen were trying to protect our borders. And that just kind of lit something in me. I wanted to go down there so bad I couldn't stand it, but because of where I was at that point, I couldn't figure out how to do it. Well, then the next thing that popped up was in 2009 when Rick Santelli made his rant on the floor of the exchange. and because we were fixing to have a bailout and help people make their home payments. And he sort of said, we need to have a tea party on the shores of Lake Michigan and start dumping some tea. And of course, that's the origination really of where the tea party started. A lot of people were on, heard that and 
began it, well, I was running around frantically trying to find a tea party to join and wasn't doing any good. I signed up for every tea party thing I could find online, just trying to do something. Couldn't find anybody in, in anywhere around where I was in, in uh, Hall County that were doing it. I had contacted the Atlanta Tea Party and that didn't get, do me any good. So finally, out of just desperation, I started a tea party in Hall County and uh, invited about 10 families that I thought had the same views that I did. And they did, they did have the same views. And I said, okay, how many wanna get started here and work, work in Hall County and form this little tea party? Zero, <laughs> none did. So I continued to operate as really as a one-man tea party, party for about uh, a year, a little over a year. And during that period of time, uh, I, I did fly up to Washington to a, a, a meeting in November of uh, 2010. And at that meeting, they asked, they, well, they first they explained something called a health care compact agreement. And then they asked for volunteers in the state to, in their various states to push this thing through the state legislature. Well, I'm up there kind of by myself. I'm looking around. I don't see anybody else from Georgia, and so I, who's going to do it if I don't? So I raised my hand and I volunteered to do that, not knowing at all what I was going to, what that was, what that meant. And of course, when I got back home, I promptly forgot about it. <laughs> Two weeks uh, into January, I get a telephone call wanting to know if I can be in Houston, Texas to learn how to actually do that. So I flew out to Houston, Texas, and there I met uh, two great folks uh, that live up in the Dalton area, um, Ed Painter and Linda Fowler. And together we came up with a plan to get this thing through the, our legislature in Georgia. So that year we started and we were successful. Uh, we were actually the first state in the nation to actually get the healthcare compact agreement signed and we were just, you know, really elated with that. And what that would do if enough states sign on to the compact, it literally moves uh, the power over health care out of the hands of the federal government into the states that signed on to it. It also block granted uh, Medicare, Medicaid payments to the states to move that out of the hands of the federal government. Mm. And it's still laying out there. Uh, the uh, last time I looked, it seemed like there were maybe eight or ten states that had actually approved it, so we still need more states to do it. But it was still an attempt to, to try to push back against what the federal government was doing, and that, that was one of the things that uh, really uh, excited me was just the ability to try to do that. And since then, uh, I've been very active uh, here in the state of Georgia down at the Capitol trying to promote a few good bills and trying to stop a lot of bad ones. And, so that's kind of my, my history. I didn't just jump into this and say, I just want to run for Congress. It's kind of in a buildup over several years. And when I first stepped up to do this, nobody else in my district was, had, had, had volunteered to, to run. Matter of fact, we've been trying to get several people to, to step up and run. Nobody would do it. And I just could not stand watching the votes I was seeing coming out of our ninth district representative's office uh, continue uh, without being challenged. Uh, they're just very, he, he, occasionally he'll do some good things, but there are just too many bad votes that I keep seeing him make up there. Uh, I know he likes to talk about regulations and things like that. I was watching a video recently where he was talking about regulations and how uh, those things were just destroying business and hurting education. And yet, he says things like that. I call that his dog and pony show because he'll talk those kind of things to us, but then he'll vote for education bills. And for me, that's incompatible. If you don't think the federal government belongs in education, and I don't because it's not a constitutional um, thing that has been allowed, uh, given to them by the states, then any time an educational bill comes up to me, you vote no. Uh, the states, it depends on what state. I think Georgia gets something like, I don't remember the exact percentage, but I think it's around 20 or 25% of their budget comes from the federal government for education. And for whatever that small amount is, we're letting them run everything we do in the state of Georgia. And this ESA bill that was just passed in December is even worse. It, 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 it really took a, a toll on uh, even the 10th Amendment. They actually, in that bill, rewrote part of the 10th Amendment 
in essence, is what they were doing because where it was reserved to the states, now it's reserved to the states, except where the federal government has, has some input. Yeah. The, the money. Really? <laughs> follow, follow the money. Yeah. Follow the money. Okay. So that's, that's kind of where I am, and that's, that's what I want to go to Washington to do, is I want, I want to do everything I can to turn this country back to the Constitution. And what that's going to require is the people have got to know our Constitution, because if we don't know what our Constitution says, we don't know whether they're voting for it or against it. And that's just the bottom line. So the burden really comes back on the people, and that's been one of the things I've been trying to, to help people do. Uh, understand is certain aspects of our Constitution and our history. Um, one uh, presentation that I, that I really enjoy doing and I've done for quite a few places across the, the state deals with, uh, it begins with the Magna Carta in 1215 and it kind of shows how this concept that our founders developed of we the people came about because it was really the people that forced King, Jan King John to sign Magna Carta, which he did not want to do. No. <laughs> and so it's, it's been the same all through history. Uh, 1776, again, it was the people that were standing up against the king. And, and there's just a tremendous amount of, of aspects in our government that we are not aware of. Uh, for instance, there's a bill right now going through the state of Georgia. It's HB 941. Mm -hmm. And what that bill does is it is going to be destructive to the grand jury from the standpoint that it's it's all about uh, the police and I'm not against the police I, I, I love these guys and we need them out there uh, keeping us safe but when there comes a time for a policeman to go before a grand jury he does not need to be operating on one set of rules and the rest of the citizens operating under another set of rules and that's what HB 941 does it it, it, it kind of hog ties the hands of the grand jury as to what they can and can't do and a grand jury uh, historically always has to be totally free once it's empowered then they sh they have the right to investigate anything that comes before them or anything they know about and what's been happening is because we don't understand the grand jury process most grand juries let the district attorney dictate to them what they do and what they don't do. Hmm. And that's, that's just not the way it is. And you go back to even with the, the regular jury, when you're sitting uh, in a jury on a trial, we are not told now that we have the right to judge the law as well as the facts in a case. And that is very, very important to freedom. And it's also, I think, one of the main reasons why the federal government did away with juries on administrative law. Because if, they, if we went before a jury on a lot of these administrative law situations, right. I think the jury would be overturning a lot of uh, regulations. But because we go before an administrative judge, that opportunity is not there. But even in the Georgia Constitution, in Article 1, Section 1, it clearly tells us that the jury has the right to judge the law as well as the facts of a case. And judges no longer tell us that. That stopped in, in 1895 when the Supreme Court ruled that it wasn't any longer a requirement. Hmm. That was so interesting. But that, that kind of brings up the, uh, the Pastors Protection Act. Yes. That uh, has been making its way through the House. There are elements of it I understand, but there's a lot of elements of it that I disagree with very, very strongly. And, you know, it's one of those pieces of legislation that uh, certain people have supported and stood on their tiptoes to, 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 to yeah. praise it. So. I'm, I'm like you. I have, have, have mixed emotions on that, uh, on that piece of legislation. From one side, I can see how with the way things are going, we need to try to do something to protect religious freedom, but the clause phrase that's in there is uh, how does how does that phrase go? If I can remember it, uh, government. Uh, oh, my mind's gone blank on me. Well, it, it appears that what is what is doing is it's giving the government the arbitration position as yeah, to decide. I can't and, remember the exact phrase, but yeah. what it does, if compelling government interest, that's the phrase I was looking for. Yeah. And, you know, the government can really 
determine anything is in their compelling interest if they want to. Now, lawyers have explained to me why that is a very high bar that they have to jump over, but it's still, to me, it's a little bit scary uh, when it sounds to me like the government can kind of, whatever they feel is a compelling government interest now, we've got to obey them. Right. And that's just really scary when, when it comes to our religion freedom, religious freedom. Right. Yeah, and then somebody wants to have something to compare it to for those of us who've done land development or have rental properties, just think about eminent domain. It's right. in the government's best interest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that, see, see how that works for you. Yeah, that's, a, that's another area that, that's really changing. Uh, you know, all through our history, the only time government condemned land was when it was going to the public good directly, not through a developer. And now we're seeing government uh, step in and condemn land, give it to a developer, and then he takes it and makes some big profits out of it. And, you know, that's another area that, that really needs to, to be looked at. And I don't know whether that would take something from Congress to change that or what, but, uh, you know, that's certainly something that needs to, to be addressed because we don't need those kind of situations occurring in our nation that's just not right yeah and in the georgia house right now some of the the issue one of the issues today down there was on the expansion of marta and in that expansion of marta i'm, I'm proud to see that some of the representatives in south gwinnett uh, basically are pushing back on that they don't want it they want the funding allocated to expand the 85 316 corridor which has been promised and talked about for several years versus uh, the money being used on this MARTA grant to block grants to take land and purchase land from from people around that 285 corridor. Yeah, that's that's another situation that not, you know. Then this, this, all of our citizens in our state, we really need to to wake up and pay attention to what goes on down there because the real key, besides pushing at the federal level by our uh, representatives to go back to the Constitution, the other area where that's got to take place has got to be at the local level and the state level. The, the founders intended for the states to really ha have pretty strong control over the federal government, but that's kind of uh, dissipated over the years. And I know there have been several bills we have uh, pushed to go into uh, the, the House down there. And invariably, we'll get a letter back that says, oh, well, you can't do this because of the supremacy clause. And it's my understanding from just talking to different folks, apparently that's what the uh, universities now are teaching, that whatever the federal government says is supreme over what the state says. And, you know, if you go back and, and look at the original intent of the Constitution, you don't see it that way. The Supremacy Clause was int intended only for the enumerated powers. Correct. In those areas, the federal government is supreme. But in all other areas, that was left up to the states. And we've gotten away from that. And But part of that is because that's what the legal profession is telling our state legislators down there. And bless their hearts, they don't know the Constitution better than the regular people. And I'm talking about our state legislators don't. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and those university professors, even ones that managed to become president, don't seem to quite understand the Constitution or they, be able to follow it. Yeah, they either don't or they don't want to. I don't know which it is. But I think well. it's a combination of both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On, on the Constitution, I mean, I can tell you from what you've been saying, you know, I agree with you what you're saying. But there's also the other side that says you and I are completely wrong on our interpretation of the Constitution. It, you know, you get that it's a living, breathing, on-growing document instead of black and white. Yeah. And, 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 and how do you, you know, and then what you just said about the education, you know, is if you're ruining the minds when they're young, they're going to have a ruined mind when they get older. Yeah. They're not going to understand. So how do you, how do you combat that? Well, you're absolutely right about the, what's going on with the ruining of the minds in our young people. Uh, but as far as a living, breathing constitution, and we are constantly bombarded by that, let me just remind people that a living constitution, uh, there's another word for that, king. Yes. That's a living constitution, and that's what we <coughs> had un, under, under King John when Magna Carta was, was, was forced on him. And they did that because they wanted to bind him down so that he couldn't just do anything on sort of a willy-nilly basis. 
And that's what our founders said. Jefferson made the statement that let the government not be free, but be bound by the chains of the written word. And where the living part comes in, it's simply because we will not go back and read the supporting evidence that is available that the founders wrote that took place when the debates were going on over the Constitution. If you read what was being written back then, it becomes fairly obvious what the wordage mean. Uh, I don't know whether you want to go into natural born citizen or not, but to me that's yeah. a, a really good situation right there where if you go back to what the founders knew and what they meant, it becomes very clear what they were talking about. And uh, we just can't get people to go back and study this stuff. No, it's, they want the, the whatever they can get on their iPhone version of, of history and, and whatever is on there is the truth because it's on the yeah. internet, it has to be true. Well, so many people have an agenda uh, in, in, in changing the Constitution because there's something that they're trying to get for their side. Yep. And, you know, that's that's never been my goal. I'm not out to try to get anything for, for my side or any side. You know, it's just we know what was meant. We know what it said. If we go back to it, we can eliminate our, our debt process just simply by going back to the Constitution. Yeah, would it be tough? Yeah, it'd be tough. And it's not something that can be done overnight because... You know, you've got to wind down these programs. There's, I don't believe there's any way to go in there and just completely carte blanche cut them off. No. But if congressmen and senators don't begin to vote no on some of these budgetary things that they're doing, we're never going to get them to stand up and do it. Yeah. So my, my attitude, it's, it's like the, these cromnibus and omnibus bills that they keep where they just cram everything in there. To me, you're obligated to vote no on it. Make them separate all that stuff out. Once they get it separated out, then we can cut here and we can cut there. But as long as they're throwing it all into one pot, uh, nothing's ever going to change. Let me ask you one more question. You know, I've heard what you're saying before from other people who have run for office, and you know, from this state and from other states. But it seems when they get to Washington and they get inside that beltway, their, their brain flips off and something else happens. You know, how do you avoid that? And I've asked this of other people and got very answers, but I, I've seen people who've been there first term, second term, third term, and you can see a difference in them and they can't see it, but you know, we who only see them every six months or every year can see a big difference and watch their voting record and watch it change. You know, how the heck does anybody avoid that? Well, I know it can be done. Uh... I have seen some others up there do it. Uh, Thomas Massey from Kentucky is one uh, that stands by the Constitution and just really doesn't budge. So it can be done. I think the answer to, to your question is whether a person has higher aspirations. If, if I go up there and my main goal is to see how much power I can accrue and how many big committees that I can get on, then I'm going to acquiesce to what leadership wants. If I want a nice office up there, I'm probably going to acquiesce to what they want. If I don't care about that stuff, and if I don't care where they put me for an office, then it doesn't make any difference to me what they say about yeah. voting. I don't care. And frankly, that's where I am. I am so fed up with what I'm seeing going on. I just really don't care about any of that stuff. And, of course, I'm not exactly a spring chicken, yeah. so I'm not going to be up there forever. But uh, it's just, to me, that if you go up there and you've got aspirations, you're never going to hold the line. And our current sitting congressman, uh, I think in, in both of the districts up in this area, both of them have shown us that they have aspirations for something besides just the country. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know. yeah, no. and, and and just to remind people that this year is the United States and the Constitution's 240th birthday. So when you look at the rest of the civilized world and the uncivilized world, I would say our Constitution is the foundation and should be maintained in every aspect of our state and federal government and utilized locally as well. I think we would be on a much stronger footing if we did that. 
You're exactly right, and uh, you know. But here again, it's it's a problem that we all face because we all have got to know that Constitution. You know, that's that's the single biggest reason I think why we've gotten into the situation we're in is because just as citizens, we don't know it. Yeah. Absolutely. And so we don't know when they're doing right and when they're doing wrong. Um, there's a bill, for instance, down at the state house right now. It's uh, HB 929, National Voter Act, where National Popular Voter Voters Act, where we're gonna where they want to elect the uh, president by popular vote. Well, what that does, and you know, our legislators down there when they read that, immediately the first thing should pop into their mind is, wait a minute. This circumvents the Electoral College and what the Constitution says. Oh, okay, I can't vote for this because it's unconstitutional on its face. Right. But I've been down there talking to them. Guess what? They Some don't. of them think it's a good idea. Yeah, they think it's good as long as they're in the popular pool. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, if you're not uh, the kid that gets picked for the kickball team, you might not, you might not want to want to be there yeah and what 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 the national popular vote will in in essence do is it will put the large metropolitan areas in in charge of who our next president is so it's no wonder understanding that that the all the states currently that have approved it are all blue states absolutely so i mean that should tell our legislators something but so far the ones i've talked to that hadn't even dawned on them yet yeah yeah, it makes, you, it makes you question a lot of things. So, um, How can interested citizens support you, and how do they get in touch with you on your campaign? Uh, you can go to my, my website uh, and make a donation, and you can also contact me through the website. That's www.scoopingforcongress.com, and that can be either the num- numerical four or the word four, and you spell scooping S C U P is in Paul I N, and that's one uh, good way. The the best thing that you can do is to tell your friends about me. You know, learn about me. You can call me if you've got questions. My cell phone is 770-287-4372. I'll be glad to speak with you about specific questions if you have them. But uh, the best thing that that can happen is to tell your friends and encourage your friends to investigate my website and just let them know that I don't have an agenda up there other than to save our nation and to return it to the constitutional pr- uh, principles that we were founded on. Right. And something else I want to just touch on it, stuff because I know we've talked to in, in, on some other issues. Um, where do you see Georgia as it relates in the national scene uh, as far as with the Southeast primary and this, this presidential year? The, the, what Brian Kemp attempted to do was to really give uh, the Southeast and, and Georgia in particular a real voice in who gets nominated. And I think that was probably a, a pretty good idea. I kind of like what he's done there. And he's worked with several states. And, Apparently, for some reason, Mississippi chose not to, to join in uh, with, with several of the others. But I think that it has definitely opened up the South, and particularly Georgia, to make them a real player in the, the presidential campaign, uh, because now we are up in the early stages instead of kind of behind the scenes. And by bringing all these states together, it has certainly it's certainly going to make an impact on, on the presidential primary. Okay, and uh, as far as how are you how are you seeing your support proceeding, and what are your next steps as far as your your campaign going forward, events and that type thing? Well, the campaign is going really well. I've, I'm really being encouraged as as I get out and, and meet people, and they, when they find out that that I'm running. Uh, People are just excited. We're just so glad somebody has stepped up to, to run against the current sitting congressman. And so right now, my, my main main goal is to get the word out, uh, speaking engagements. You know, if anybody in this area has has a uh, an event or a club that they would like for me to speak at, I would be glad to come, and they can ask me all kinds of questions at, in a situation like that. So uh, that's kind of my main goal. Uh, Get, getting out and trying to get the word out, trying to meet people and let them know that I'm available and, and 
ready to go. Okay. And then I know Denise Duncan with our Chamber of Commerce listens to the show on the, the uh, YouTube side. So, Denise, you're looking for speakers to come to the Chamber. So, uh, you go to Mike's website and, and uh, reach out to him. I'm, I'm sure you'd be glad to come Be glad back. to. Be glad right. to. Thank All you, right. Will. All right. Well, All right. thank you for being on. And uh, please keep us updated as you move forward. We'll do that. Appreciate well, the opportunity. Before, thank you very much. Before you turn off, man, Mike, I want to thank you, too. I mean, I have the belief that every incumbent should have somebody running against them. Amen. Uh, uh, you know, people talk about term limits and stuff, but, you know, one way to limit somebody's term is to encourage other people to run, get the ideas out there, and then make your choice. And that's and, the ultimate term limit. Yep. And good luck to you, and thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and we have a surprise guest to stop by and, and invite him to come by. I'm glad to see Mickey Tuck. You were able to stop in and see us. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we've been up here all afternoon uh, campaigning, uh, uh, trying to differentiate the people that were in the 14th and the 9th. And so we've met a lot of great people in the 9th, but also a lot, met a lot of great people in the 14th, asked them to, to vote for me and to uh, you know, give me a look between now and May the 24th and hope I can uh, persuade them, convince them to to vote for me, and uh, like I've been telling them, you know, if you if you like what's going on up in D.C., you know, re-elect my opponent. If uh, if you don't like what's going up on D.C., you know, we need to clean the house and and re-elect uh, uh, or not re-elect, but elect some new people to to go up there that you know that will represent them and to have their interests best at heart. And you know, we'll just um, somebody up there that that's I was truly going to make an effort to reduce spending, uh, push for smaller and limited government, you know, to uh, to get us back to the U.S. Constitution, to where you know you know if if we can't base our vote you know if we can't base our votes on the foundation of the Constitution you know we we don't need to vote for it you know if it if it doesn't line up with the Constitution we don't need to um, you know from what's been going on up there there's um, they're not adhering to that I mean we just. You know, we just look at the runaway spending. We look at the things that we're funding that we shouldn't be funding, and uh, you know all the. You know what really gets me is just the, the half truths, the, the deceptions, the, uh, you know the vote this way and then do a show vote so they can come back home and say, well I voted against this or for that, and hoping people will ignore the other votes that they made that actually funded or supported those things. So it's a, it's time to change, and uh, I'm noticing North Georgia. You know, last week I was, over, I was actually over in the 9th District for a, kind of a, a North Georgia rally. And, you know, there's a movement in all of North Georgia, just in the 9th to 14th, and even it's even trickled down into the 11th, that there, there's, a, there's a revolution going on up here. And, and the voters and the, and the citizens of North Georgia are, are taking notice, and they're ready to uh, take action and, and, and for North Georgia to lead the way to uh, – to change Washington, D.C. That's, that's good. Mark? Uh, Mickey, just give us a brief background, uh, you know, what you've done previous to today. <laughs> previous to today, uh, I've been I've been on the campaign trail pretty much since uh, last February, so I've been doing this a year. I've been all throughout the 14th District, been to the count, several different counties several times, been to uh, GOP meetings and, and, uh, and to Tea Party meetings and just wherever anybody will – will have me and and like I've been telling everybody you know it's it's the grassroots efforts that's going to win this campaign and and I believe the grassroots are, are growing out there that are wanting to change uh, the election you know I feel like the campaign is going real well uh, the I feel like the the feedback and and also people contributing to the campaign is, is picking up I, I I need more contributions out there, you know. Right. I, it's gonna be good. And I'm, I'm not going to be able to outspend or outraise my opponent, so it's very important to, for people to contribute that can, and and especially get the word out that hey, there's Mickey Tuck, there's this guy, he's a super conservative, super guy that that uh, wants to truly serve the people and serve the people of the 14th district and to have their best interests at heart. That wants to go to Washington D.C. to to represent them, and uh, that's that's the main focus I need. Is people just to really get out. Get out the word about me in the 14th district. And, and the same question I asked before, Mike, how do you avoid, if you would get to Washington, becoming an established, you know, what they call the establishment yep. person that, you know, that's it's not all of them are in that category, but most of them, you know, it just seems something happens when you get there. 
it can be done. It's like Mike was saying before as I was listening. He, uh, you know, if you're up there on agenda to looking for, you know, more power and more position and more, uh, you know, chair committee or be on a powerful committee, then you're not going to, you're, you're going to turn a deaf ear to your people and listen to the ones that can pitch you in those positions, which is your Washington establishment and your, and your leadership up there. And it's like I said, I had someone ask me the other day, they said, well, Mickey, you know how it works up there. To, you know, if you don't devote how we're, how you want us to vote, we're going to, you know, the janitor clause is going to be your office. He said, what would be your reaction? I told him, I said, well, hand me the key. So, <laughs> I, I, I'm up there to, to, to serve, to serve, you know, to serve the people of the 14th District. You know, I, my heroes up there are Justin Amash and, and Thomas Massey and some of those, and they've been able, you know, they've been able to hold the line and, uh, and stand on their principles and, and, and remain their integrity. You know, this election is about integrity. You know, I, t I ask everybody out there, I know this radio show covers the 9th and the 14th, but, you know, look at your congressmen and look at them from an integrity side issue. Have they kept their word? Have they gone up there to do and done what they say they were going to do? Um, are they trying to deceive you with show votes over their bad votes? You know, um, if you say uh, that, yeah, my congressman is doing those things, I I'm sorry, and I know it's it maybe it's, it's rude and crude, but you don't need to reelect them. Yeah. You need to, you know, give the, the new guys a, a shot to, because, uh, you know, just, you know, we talk about term limits, and, you know, the voters are the, are the ones that enforce the term limits. You know, uh, send us up there, and if you don't like what, we, what we're doing, then, you know, kick us out and, and re-elect or, or elect someone else. You know, with the term limit, you, you hear it all across the country, and everybody wants term limits, and, and we want to get rid of the, the ones that are up there, but when you get down to it, they say, but not my guy. Yeah. You know, my guy's all right. I want to get rid of the guy over there or the guy in this state. You know, I mean, it's a very hard to get rid of my guy. Yeah. But, you, you know, you have to look at their record, which is all available online. Exactly. Uh, you can look at how they voted and then ask you, you know, at your campaign stops, how you would vote on these issues. Exactly. You know, that's the crazy thing. I saw a poll recently, 87% of Americans not dislike or disapprove, but hate Congress. So that leaves, what, 13%, so I assume that's the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the lobbyists are the only ones that like the, those that are in Congress. So, you know, if there's 87% of Americans hate Congress, then they need to take a you know, look in the mirror and say, well, if I hate them, why am I re-electing them? And, uh, you know, there's there's big difference between me and, and my opponent, which is Tom Graves, and I ask you that you go to my to my website and check it out. That's it's at mickeytuck2016.nationbuilder.com. If you really want to see what I'm about and, and what my opinion is on things, I ask you to go to my Facebook page, Mickey Tuck 2016, and because I'm I'm a guy, I'm I'm not afraid to voice my opinion. I'm not afraid to to voice how I feel on issues. And, you know, and while you're calling up to the congressman's office, ask him how he's going to vote on something, and he tells you, I don't know yet, or, the, or his staff says, if I haven't talked to the congressman today, you can go to my Facebook page and, and see right there and then, if I was your congressman, how I, how I would vote on that uh, major vote or issue that was coming up. All right. All right. Sounds good. All right. Uh, what, have you got any other events that you've got scheduled uh, where voters in the rest of the 14th District can can uh, come out to see you? Well, I have on March the the first Tuesday of this month. I believe it's either. That'd be the, that'd the, be the eighth. Nope. No, no it'd be the first or the. Well, yeah, March, March 1st is the, is the presidential primary. So, so, yeah. okay. so it's, I believe it's next Tuesday on the. No. Hang on, let me get my, my, my trusty, my lovely wife is here. She can probably tell her on the counter. But the next event I'm going to have is going to be in Floyd County, the Floyd County Republican Women. I'm going to be the, the guest speaker there. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll be speaking there if anyone wants to come out. There. It's, it's not just for the women only. Anybody who wants to come can come. It'll be at the Red Lobster there on Short Avenue in, in Rome, and you can learn more, more about me there. And, uh, and anybody who would like for me to come out and, and speak, uh, you know, 
qualifying starts the 7th of March and, and the election is May 24th. So if you want me to come speak, it's, I'm, I'm going to go first come, first serve uh, basis pretty much. So I hope you'll come there. And also in, uh, in April, I believe it's the, I wish I have my calendar laying down here in front of me. I believe it's April 23rd or that third, you're right around there. I'll be speaking of Chattooga County GOP meeting up there on that evening. And uh, also there's going to be a, a candidate uh, kind of a meeting greet up in Chattooga County. The, I think it's the first Sunday in April. I believe that's April. Like I said, I don't have to count her from me. It's either first or third, somewhere around there, that up in Chattooga County. And uh, also I'm planning on, if I can get my work schedule worked out, because I'm a, a working, working guy, I work night shift. Uh, as I say, I'm an electrician, not a politician. I'm an electrician by trade in a manufacturing in Cedartown, Georgia. Um, I'm planning on uh, being up in Murray County. Murray's going to have a, a meet and greet at their, at their meeting coming up uh, next month. So I plan on participating in that. And I am also hoping if I can twist the 14th district uh, chairman's arm and those in the executive committee, I'm hoping I'll have the opportunity also to speak at the 14th district convention. But that, as I say, I, I believe it's going to take some arm twisting and, yeah. <laughs> and hopefully some, uh, maybe some, some, some yelling and persuasion by some of those who live in the 14th district. It's on the executive committee and the local GOPs that I, that I will get to speak at the 14th district. I will be there, Great. regardless. Well, Mickey, it's good to have you on again. Thank you. And please keep us informed. Uh, we will put it on Facebook uh, for the show, any of your upcoming events, and put it on our calendar sure will. as well. Uh, Bart, you've got something that you still want to, to touch on. Yeah, touch on, yeah. Uh, although we tape this show on a Thursday, it will be played on Saturday afternoon. Saturday evening, this Saturday, February 27th at Chattahoochee Technical College in Jasper at 7 p.m. The Sock Hops, which is a rock and roll oldie concert group, will be playing a nice concert. It starts at 7 o'clock. Uh, you can buy your tickets at the door. You don't have to worry if you don't have a ticket. Tickets are $20. Part of the funds will go to pro, uh, provide funds for American Legion Post for their Operation Comfort Warriors, which helps all the local wounded veterans from this area. So if you're not doing anything Saturday night, uh, you have a little bit of rock and roll, a little bit of the oldies music is still left in your feet or your legs, please come to Chattahoochee Tech at 7 o'clock. Uh, it'll be a good time evening, and we'll hope to see you there. All right. Yeah, and when there are our tickets available uh, here at Rocco's Pub and Grill on 515, as well as the UPS store in Jasper. So y'all come out for a good cause. And just a reminder that the American Legion Post 149 and the Operation Comfort Warriors is 100% volunteer. 100% of the proceeds go to the veterans for those needs. It is not uh, burned up in administrative cost and that type of thing. It's all volunteer. I want to thank everybody for being on the show again uh, this week and uh, look forward to the show next week. Thank y'all. Bye.